So yesterday we started talking about what will eventually lead to the AGT conjecture. Well, by now it's not much of a conjecture anymore, it's AGT correspondence. And let me just remind you of what we're after. So first of all, uh, I'm just going to claim that there exists for the n equals 2 superconformal field theories labeled by some punctured Riemann surface. So give me some punctured Riemann surface. I can produce a 40 n equals 2 SCFT. Now give me a punctured Riemann surface, and I can also try to compute two-dimensional CFT observables on this Riemann surface if I interpret the punctures as vertex operator insertions. So on the other hand, we can compute 2D CFT correlators if I have some clear idea of which, uh, which vertex operators I should uh, insert at these punctures. And the AGT correspondence says that if I take this 4D n equals 2 superconformal field theory, I compute this partition function on the four sphere, or actually on the squashed four sphere, then there is a, a relationship between these two uh, elements. So, but before getting to this, let me come back to this first statement that there is a 4dn equals 2 SCFT associated to any Riemann surface. So yesterday we, st uh, we started discussing class S theories, that's how these theories are named. That's S theories of type A1. <coughs> so we started by considering four free hypermultiplets We observed that this theory has a USB8 flavor symmetry. We focused on a subgroup of this USB8 symmetry, which is an SU2 times SU2 times SU2. Subgroup of this USB8. And now we designed some picture. We said, OK, each of these subgroups of the flavor symmetry we're going to denote in some picture maybe as follows. So this picture is just a representation of a theory of free fo four free hypermultiplets where it pictorially you make clear that there is this SU2 times SU2 times SU2 subgroup. So each of these punctures corresponds to one of these flavor symmetry subgroups. And then we started talking about a next example of a theory with an SU2 gauge group. So we looked at an SU2 gauge theory with four <laughs> fundamental flavors. So this was a superconformal field theory precisely because this matter content is such that the beta function vanishes. And we remember that if you have four flavor, uh, four fundamental hypermultiplets of SU2, because the fundamental of SU2 is pseudo-real, this theory will carry an SO8 flavor symmetry. So in a quiver description, the original theory looks like an SU2 gauge group with these four fundamental flavors. And then I decided to focus on some splitting of these four fundamental flavors. I'm going to group them instead of us in one 
set of four in two sets of two. So here these four flavors carried this SO8 flavor symmetry, but now I split them in two groups. So I have two hypermultiplets in a pseudo real representation of SU2. These carry SO4 flavor symmetry. These carry SO4 flavor symmetry. And SO4 is, of course, SU2 times SU2. So I can design some new quiver notation where I have the SU2 gauge group, and I make manifest these two SU2 flavor symmetries on each side of this quiver. So this we drew yesterday as well. And then I observed that this picture is really equivalent to a picture like this. where I have taken two of these types of objects. I've taken two times four hypermultiplets, and I gauge the diagonal SU2. So just taking, thinking about this theory, before I decide to gauge, I really have eight hypermultiplets. And then I gauge an SU2 subgroup of the flavor symmetry of those eight hypermultiplets. That subgroup is precisely the diagonal subgroup of two such trinions. That's the name that these things are given. So I take two such trinions, I focus on an SU2 times SU2 times SU2 for each of these two trinions, and I gauge a diagonal subgroup of the SU2. That is precisely what gives you this theory, and that is precisely represented in this picture. And here I should observe that the tube in this picture is nothing else than the gauge theory, ga uh, than the gauging in the quantum field theory. OK, that was our second example yesterday. So let's now do a new example, just to get some more intuition. But we slowly start seeing Riemann surfaces appear, which we can associate in some canonical way to four-dimensional theories with in SU2 gauge groups. So let me do a third example. I'm going to start looking at a bit longer quivers. So let me look at this quiver. Now I have two SU2 gauge groups. I have two fundamental flavors charged, or two flavors transforming in the fundamental of this gauge group. I have two flavors transforming in the fundamental of this gauge group. And in between, I have a bifundamental, an, an object that is fundamental both under this gauge group and under this gauge group. So each of these two gauge groups effectively has four hypermultiplets. Two are manifest, the other two come from this bifundamental object. So both of these gauge groups have zero beta functions. So this is a superconformal field theory. And as before, we would like to get a bit of an understanding of what flavor symmetry this thing has. So again, two hypermultiplets charged under SU2, because the two of SU2 is pseudo-real, they carry an SO4 flavor symmetry. And the same over here. These guys carry an SO4 flavor symmetry. Now this bifundamental object, so it, this, this, this isn't hypermultiplet represented by this link here, which transforms under the fundamental of both these SU2s. This bifundamental object is real. You can, you can think of it as the vector of SO4 just decomposed into SU2 times SU2. So it is a real object. And real representations, you remember from the first lecture, carry an one real object, one object ca uh, charged under a real representation of the gauge group carries an USP flavor symmetry, namely a USP2 flavor symmetry. So this link carries a USP2 flavor symmetry, which is, of course, the same as SU2. So in total, we have two SU2s from this SO4. We have another two SU2s from this SO4. And we have a fifth SU2 under which this bifundamental is uh, transforming. So in total, this theory has five SU2 factors in its flavor symmetry group. 
And let me represent it in a picture similar like this, making manifest all these five SU2s. So I'm going to break the SO4 just like we had over here. This SO4 was split in picture like this. So I have an SU2 and another SU2. I have my first SU2 gauge group. <coughs> this bifundamental carried an SU2 flavor symmetry. I have my second SU2 gauge group, and then again, I have this fork of two SU2s. So this quiver, I like to represent like this just like we represented this quiver like this. Or if I'm essentially fattening the lines of this quiver and represent gauge groups by tubes, this thing can be represented as as follows. Where again, the tubes here are the two gaugings we're performing. Okay, so this is fun. It seems that any Riemann surface we draw, any punctured Riemann surface we draw, corresponds to some uh, gauge theory with SU2 gauge groups. But is this really true? Is it any Riemann surface? So let's think about that for a second. What if I draw something like this? This looks a little bit wilder. So we have this triple gauging of one single trinion. So in, in, in that picture, in a picture like that, I'm really doing something like this. Where I have one trinion sitting in the middle and I used all three of the flavor symmetries of that trinion, of that, that beast over here, to gauge something else. So is this still an SCFT? And the answer is yes, it is. Since for each of these uh, gauge theories, you can verify that they all have beta function equal to zero, since they all carry two or, well, four fundamental flavors, which are manifest, like, well, it's these, these pairs are the fundamental flavors carried under each of these SU2s. So it looks a little bit strange, perhaps, but even this theory is an honest to God SU2 gauge theory that you can, in principle, write down. Even though it's not, it's not a linear quiver, I can impossibly draw this thing in a way like I had over here. I cannot take this thing and draw some kind of a more mundane quiver description. Is that clear to everyone? Since if I have mundane quiver descriptions, I will always have, at worst, situations like this, where two of the indices of one trinion are gauged, but the third one is sticking out. In this case, I really gauged all three, and that is still a conformal operation, but it's not some type of regular quiver. It's what people call a generalized quiver. So really, it is a statement that seems to be true. If I take any Riemann surface with some number of punctures, it can have a non-zero genus, if you like. It will correspond to some four-dimensional n equals two superconformal field theory. So this was all for SU2s. We had SU2 gauge groups. We had SU2 flavor symmetries sitting everywhere. That's where the disclaimer comes from, that it's class S tiers of type A1. A1 is SU2, and we see SU2s all over the place. 
Sorry, say again. OK, sorry. Yes, I should have said. You should, you should make your Riemann surface uh, by stitching together a pair of pants. So it's OK, you're right. It's not any Riemann surface. It should be decomposable in pair of pants, where by pair of pants, I just mean this thing, the trinion. So two puncture is too few. No, I mean, I don't know what you call them, unique. Uh, no, it's not unique. Let's let's give an example of. Well, let let me get back to this question in a second. It's not unique if you keep track of a bit more information than I've been telling you so far. So let's first briefly look at the generalization to higher rank, just to point out a few features. But in the rest of the talk, I will not really care about the higher rank generalization. So let's, instead of having four free hypermultiplets, let's look at nf squared, or well, let's just do n squared free hypermultiplets for n larger than 2. So this thing, again, it carries a USP 2n squared flavor symmetry. We can choose to focus on a subgroup of that flavor <coughs> symmetry, which is SUN times SUN times U1. And we can decide to represent this object, again, by a three-punctured sphere or by some trinion, like over there. But now we need to have two types of punctures, just because I want to associate these flavor symmetries to the punctures, but obviously U1 is not the same as SUN, so I have two types of puncture. The dot corresponds to the U1, and the two circles correspond to the SUN factor. OK, so now if I have this pictorial representation, I can just run the same game. I'm going to look at an SUN gauge theory with two N fundamental flavors. But now observe that the flavor symmetry of this thing is not enhanced because the N of SUN, it's a complex representation. So this just carries a U2N flavor symmetry. But I can still choose to consider a group of N and another group of N in a picture like this, so we where we start getting some linear quivers. And these two groups of n hypermultiplets each carry an un flavor symmetry. Then still following exactly the same steps as up there, I'm going to represent this as my sun gauge group, a u1 flavor symmetry and an SUN flavor symmetry. So I'm splitting this UN in SUN times U1. The same on the other side. And again, just like over there, I'm going to represent this by some punctured Riemann surface, but now also involving these U1 punctures again because we see them sitting over here already. So this is the exact analog of that puncture, of that picture. The tube here again represents gauging. Since we're doing, well, I didn't write it. This is type n minus one. Since we're doing type a n minus one, this gauging is an S u n gauging. It's precisely this gauging. We have the u one puncture or the u one flavor and the S u n flavor, just like here. On the other side, the same. And this picture really tells you what is happening. We took two such objects, twice n squared free hypermultiplets, and we connected them by some tube, where this tube is gauging. And then, OK, we drew a, things a little bit more cleanly, where this gauging is really, you have this SUN flavor symmetry, this SUN flavor symmetry. You take the diagonal subgroup, and that is what you call your gauge group. 
that gives you that picture and that the operation I just described, taking two n squared free hypermultiplets, engaging this diagonal SUN, is precisely the same as what I described over here. So good. I can, I can draw more general linear quivers like this. You will get pictures where I start connecting this tube with another of these types of three punctured spheres. I can keep going. But over here, we noticed a slightly more funky object appear. We noticed that an object like this appears, and it we're obviously not going to get an object like this from the ingredients I've described so far. The only ingredient I really have is this, this type of a sphere. Two, what goes under the name of maximal punctures, two punctures that carry an SUN flavor symmetry, one puncture that carries a U1 flavor symmetry. If I would like to draw a quiver like that, I would really need an object, I would really need a four-dimensional theory which I can associate to this object where I have three maximal punctures. So, okay, which theory can we possibly assign to this? Now, this was uh, analyzed and studied in beautiful detail by Davide Gaiotto in his paper. Uh, the answer is, it's nothing Lagrangian, but it's some strongly coupled, um, isolated superconformal field theory. So the question marks here, without telling you how you can ever be sure of that, that this is the correct answer, is some strongly coupled, isolated SCFD. This is not supposed to be obvious. And this CFT goes under the name of TN. Maybe you've seen that somewhere. So, okay. This, this type of pictures, they really generalize, and it's a beautiful framework to understand four-dimensional n equals two superconformal field theories. But as soon as you increase the rank, you're going to have to deal with these types of theories associated to a three-puncture sphere with three maximal punctures, and then you're automatically inside the realm of strongly coupled and isolated superconformal field theories. So for the case over there, this, this Trinian theory, these four free hypermultiplets, that's the only free case that you can associate to a three-punctured sphere with three maximal punctures. In any higher rank, this beast is some strongly coupled theory. Just to be concrete, maybe some people of you are familiar with this case. So if you take A2, this is really the E6 theory of Mina, Han, and Emashansky. Okay, this was my little detour, just to indicate to you that this framework is more general than what I'm going to use. It can be generalized to higher rank. In fact, it can be generalized to different gauge group. Can, you can do D-type, you can do E-type. You can generalize even more to non-simply laced if you have twist lines. Anyway, it's a very rich story, but I will stick to the A1 case for the rest of this talk. Sorry, say again. If we please, if we engage part of gates, I think. I'm really where? Like we just keep SU2 and let SU n minus to be. In the strongly coupled theory? In which theory, sorry? In, in this table. <coughs> oh, then it won't be super conformal. If you try to gauge an SU2 with the matter content that is described there? No, I, I mean, there is SU n gaze, okay? Now I want to put SU2 symmetry as a gay symmetry and rest of others to be ungaged. Right, but that will not be conformal. The matter content is just not right to make that ever conformal. The only gauging you can do within the context I've described so far is between maximal punctures if you want to stay super conformal. I mean, if you, do, if you don't care about super conformal properties, then yeah, you can do whatever almost whatever you want, but... No. 
So let's introduce a little bit more data than what I have done so far. So I'm back to A1. I will stay in A1 for the rest of the talk. So I had this picture to represent an SU2 theory with four flavors. And I told you that this tube corresponds to gauging. But there's a little bit more data in this, in this Riemann surface than, than what I said, namely that the length of this tube is directly proportional to 1 over g yang mill squared. We can impose that as an additional rule on this picture. The longer the tube, the weaker the gauge coupling. And in fact, in the limit where the gauge coupling is, well, infinitesimal, or let's say even zero, this picture becomes infinitely stretched, and in fact, it just pinches. If you turn off the gauge coupling, you just go back to your two free theories. So that's, it's then obvious that this, this extra rule that the length of the tube is proportional to 1 over g yang mill squared sort of makes sense. Because if I separate them infinitely far, it's essentially as if I have pinched off the two, two spheres and I get my two free theories back. Is that clear to everyone? So if you have a sufficiently long tube, you're really talking about weak gauging, meaning that the yang mills coupling, which since we're talking about superconformal field theories, is really a parameter. It's not a scale as it would be in just regular quantum field theories. So weak gauging corresponds to sufficiently long tubes. But then what happens if I decide to well, make the tube less long? What is if I start dialing the gauge coupling to be larger and larger? In other words, if I start considering stronger and stronger, more and more strongly coupled theories. So I start having a picture like this. This is somewhat stronger coupled. I start having a picture like this. This is very strongly coupled, so I should keep track of which labels it were. And a part of this story is that, in fact, at this point, a new dual description of the same theory emerges. So you, you may fam be familiar with S-duality. This is exactly what will happen now. What will I do now is, this is very strongly coupled, but a new weakly coupled picture can emerge if I start pulling apart things in the other direction. So this is a different type of gauging. You see that, well, you see it from the labels. We, had, we have different matter content in the two blobs I'm gluing together. This is a different gauging. Different weak gauging. And the procedure that took us from this description by dialing the gauge coupling, we made it strongly, more and more strongly coupled, the theory. And then at one point, there is a new dual description that emerges with new degrees of freedom where the gauge coupling becomes weakly coupled again. And this is this sequence of pictures. Here, we had the tube like this, which was weakly gauged. Here we have the tube like this, which is weakly gauged. And these are two dual descriptions of the same theory. So this duality, it goes under the name of S-duality. And it was studied first, I guess, by Cybrick and Witten. And you see, I mean, if I turn this picture back like sideways, it really looks like this picture, but not quite, because you see the labels changed. Here was A, B, C, D, and here is A, C, B, D. I, if I turn it, the labels are still different. So this S-duality action, it produces a theory which looks exactly like this, but the matter content got a little bit, well, permuted. Said differently here, In this type of quiver, where we had this SO8 flavor symmetry, the hypermultiples really transformed in the vector representation of SO8. 
But over here, the hypermultiplets, these two blocks, they transform now in one of the spinner representations of SO8. So it, it really, it's the same theory, like if you write the Lagrangian, the same theory, but you should remember that over here we had an 8V, over here we have an 8S, just because these labels got a bit permuted. Is this sort of clear? This is a linear triality instead of a duality. No, I mean, it's an at the moment it's just a duality, and then I'm going to declare now what generalized S dualities are, <laughs> and then, okay, I mean, the word dual becomes a little bit moot. It's like, uh, yeah. I mean, there will be infinitely many these types of degenerations you can consider, which we're all going to call dual. So let me emphasize a bit more what I mean. Given some theory of type A1, which corresponds to some Riemann surface with some number of punctures, you can always decompose it in pairs of pants, like we have over here. We have here two pairs of pants. Over here, we have two pairs of pants. But notice they're not the same pairs of pants. So it, they're different pairs of pants decompositions, where, again, the pair of pants is, you really need to think of it like, like so. So a three-punctured sphere is, is a pair of pants, because you can draw it like this with the three punctures. So any pair of pants decomposition of a Riemann's punctured Riemann surface, which we associate to an A1 theory, corresponds to some weakly coupled <coughs> frame, like the example over here. Here we had just two. Well, actually, we have three choices, as, as you were pointing out. We have actually three choices, because we can do yet another permutation of these labels to find a third description, where instead of the spinner, we would get a cold spinner. So any pair of pants decomposition of a Riemann surface corresponds to some weakly coupled frame. And moving in between all these different descriptions corresponds to what goes under the name of generalized S-dualities. So if you do procedures like this, what it really means is you have a gauge coupling, which you start tuning to be larger and larger. And dual, a dual description emerges in terms of a different gauge theory, which is then again weakly coupled like we had in this picture. Is everyone OK with this statement? So these, at first sight, maybe useless pictures, they already contain some more physical, in, in, uh, physical information than we thought at first sight. In fact, they contain a lot more information as soon as you start thinking about cyclic Witten curves and all that kind of uh, information that is, uh, well, is available for any four-dimensional equals two superconformal field theory. But OK, I will not discuss that kind of stuff. What I do want to quickly point out is that uh, if you are just studying Lagrangian theories, say that for a higher rank again, just, just for a second, let's again look at this theory we had just now. This was just some Lagrangian theory, an SUN gauge group with n plus n hypermultiplets. If we play this kind of a game, we can go to its strongly coupled regime, and then we can try to find a new weakly coupled description. Like so. And now you see that these objects that we felt compelled to introduce, these three punctured sphere with max three maximal punctures, they really arise even when you do something as simple as taking a Lagrangian theory and dialing its gauge coupling to be larger and larger. So this is a dual description of this theory. So let's do, if we say do A2, this is just an SU3 gauge theory with six fundamental flavors. So the gauge is this 
tube. We have three plus three flavors. But over here, we find this strongly coupled bees that I just told you, this E6 theory of Minahan and Mishansky, coupled to some other stuff, which, if you are familiar with Argeria cyber duality, is precisely describing that duality. If you're not familiar with this duality, then the take-home message is just that if you take a Lagrangian theory and you try to apply dualities, or even more simply, you just turn its gauge coupling to be larger and larger, you automatically will land on descriptions which are again weakly coupled, but involve these strongly interacting SCFTs as building blocks. Okay, this was really the last thing I have to say about higher rank. Sorry, and, and what viewers response to left and the right Sorry, what? Well, here we know the quiver. This was just some Lagrangian theory with a linear quiver. It was SU3 with, in the way it's drawn here, three and three fundamental hypers, which was really coming from this picture we started off with. That is this side. Now, this side doesn't have a Lagrangian description, obviously, because we have this strongly interacting blob sitting here. So at best, you can give a generalized quiver description, just like we had the, the terminology earlier. This is some generalized quiver, which you can try to give some generalized quiver description in terms of an object that maybe looks like this. Where, OK, this piece, I, I was not really planning to describe it to you, but fine. It, it, this is the description, if you really want. So this thing is a strongly interacting blob. This is this E6 minahan mishansky theory. It doesn't have a Lagrangian description, so this is not a, a normal quiver you would typically encounter. And then, OK, this, this extra blob cages an SU2 inside this SU3, and you have one fundamental hyper of that SU2. So good, let's go back to A1 and stay there now. For A1 theories, even though we have these generalized quivers, there were still Lagrangian building blocks. The, the, the thing associated to the three punctured sphere was just a bunch of four free hypermultiplets. So all A1 theories are Lagrangian, even though we draw quivers, which you would typically not quite consider. They're still all Lagrangian if you keep track of all the flavor symmetries properly. So within that class of theories, in principles, in the Lagrangian theories, we can crank the localization machine, and we can, con we can compute of all these theories, at least in principle, their S4 partition function. Just because they're all Lagrangian, we can compute a four sphere partition function. So let's focus on a particular example. The example we started off with describing. So this is a theory I would like to consider. And as you remember, this is just an SU2 gauge theory with four flavors, where the four flavors carried as a weight flavor symmetry of which I have made manifest an SU2 to the fourth. Now for each of these SU2 flavor symmetries, I can turn on masses. So you remember if you do well, any type of localization, but in particular on the four sphere, you can turn on vector multiplets that couple to the flavor symmetries. They're not dynamical, they're background vector multiplets. And for each of these background vector multiplets inside the localization computation, you can turn on a BPS configuration. That does not break supersymmetry, so you can do it. And when you do it, you turn on masses for these different flavor symmetries. 
I guess you've heard that a few times in the school already. So I'll just, just do it. So let me write the masses corresponding to these four uh, SU2s as PA, where A is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. If you like, in terms of perhaps language that is more familiar, if you go back to this picture where you had the SU2 gauge group with the U4 flavor symmetry, we can focus on the carton, well, on the maximal torus inside here, that's a U1 to the fourth. We can turn on masses for all of these U1s. This is more canonical language than these four SU2s. And the relation between the masses you would turn on for these U1s and the masses we have turned on for these cartons inside these SU2s is as follows. If I call these masses Mi for I runs from 1 to 4, then I simply have that M1 is P1 plus P2. M2 is P1 minus P2. This is not really important. If you understand that in this picture I can turn on <coughs> these four masses, then this piece of the blackboard is, is somewhat useless information. Anyway, so these are the standard masses you would turn on for the U1 to the fourth. And they are related to these SU2 masses just by these linear combinations. OK, beautiful. So let's compute the force sphere partition function of this object. So what do I get? I will get an integral. So the gauge group is SU2. It's Cartan subalgebra as U1, so we just get one real integral, turns from minus infinity to plus infinity along the real line. What do we get? We get in here this one loop determinant, which I will specify in a second, just to remind you of how it looks like. It will depend on, on this gauge parameter, which I've also called P. You will notice, well, maybe I should call this one capital P. You will notice why I'm using everything, writing everything in terms of letters P. So we have this one loop determined, which is depends on this gauge parameter and on the four mass parameters. We have the classical action, which I will write in terms of Qs. So remember this Q and Q bar. Someone asked me that last time as well. They are canonically defined as e to the 2 pi i tau, where tau was this combination which I always forget in terms of g yang mill squared with some coefficient and the theta angle, well, this with some coefficient. Let me try to find the coefficients back. So in my conventions, it's theta over 2 pi plus 4 pi i over g yang mill squared. So that's tau. Q is e to the 2 pi i of that tau. And here I have a Q and a Q complex conjugate raised to the power p squared. Is this clear to everyone? So in principle, you have in the, in the exponent here, you have trace of the object you're integrating over squared. The so object that we're integrating over is an SU2 matrix in the carton. So it looks like this. Square this, you get p squared, p squared. Uh, trace this, you get trace the squared, and you get 2p squared. And then there are some factors. I hope I did them right. Maybe there's some factor of 2 here. So anyway, this is a classical action written in some slightly different way than I've done so far. And then, of course, we have these instant on partition functions, which we managed to write as sums over, in this case, just two tuples of Young diagrams of stuff. And we have another instant on partition function. 
So this is for the instantons at the north pole, this is for the instantons at the south pole, and the dot dot dot, you can in principle compute with these matrix integrals we discussed two days ago. Okay, this is the four sphere partition function of this particular theory. Let me also specify Z1 loop, since it will be important. The Z1 loop, depending on capital P and these mass parameters, little p, looks like, in terms of these upsilon functions, 2IP minus 2IP divided by the product for J. Well, let's do A runs from 1 to 4 of Q over 2 plus IP plus IPA. plus okay like so so okay I went back to these mu's but these mu's are still defined over here in terms of the piece where p or the mass is associated to these four SU2's okay so this object we knew how to compute Let's keep it and let's change topic. Let's change topic to studying conformal field theories. Okay. Um, so you see the upsilon really has is a function of B. You remember it's like an infinite a double infinite product of M B plus N B inverse plus plus the the imp the argument and then another factor N plus one B plus N plus one B inverse minus the argument. So there's B's for all these upsilon functions. Also this Q, Q is B plus B inverse. And then in the instant on partition function, we had these two uh, equivalent parameters for the rotations in the two orthogonal planes in R4. They also entered there. So there's B and B inverses all over the place inside these instant on partition functions. Two factors of the denominator, they look the same. They yes. I had a minus. So there, there's this minus sign. So this is one side of the correspondence I announced in the beginning. Let's do the other side, the CFT side. The CFT we should be studying is Liouville. So Liouville is some particular two-dimensional conformal field theory. But before getting to Liouville, let me just give some, general give some generalities about CFTs. So some quick, quick reminder of CFT facts. So you often hear the sta statement that the conformal field theory is completely determined as soon as you're giving 
its spectrum and its collection of three-point couplings. It's true in any dimension. Any form of field theory is, well, I'll, I'll tell you in a second what is actually determined by giving the spectrum and the three-point couplings of any three local operators. So if you have that information, you can compute any correlator of finitely many local operators. So it doesn't say anything about <coughs> defect operators, so maybe I should call this the local CFT data. If you're giving if you're given this data, you can compute any correlators of local operators. So let's see why this is true. This is the first aim to quickly remind you of why these two pieces of data are sufficient. And the reason is, of course, because conformal field theory is very constraining. It restricts uh, correlators quite well. And let's explore that restriction for a second. So conformal invariance, since Liouville is just, is just a regular CFT, it's not super symmetric or anything, I will restrict myself to just plain conformal invariance, which means that in D larger than 2, we have symmetry group D plus 1, comma 1. So remember, I, I wrote down an example of this before. We have momenta, we have rotations, we have the dilatation, we have special conformal transformations, and that's it. So these generators, if you put them together in some neat matrix, you will be able to verify that they satisfy the commutation relations of SOD plus 1, comma 1 in Euclidean signature. But in D equals to 2, which is an example where Leoville lives, actually this SO3, comma 1, which is really SL2C, but people are often somewhat sloppy. They think of <coughs> essentially two copies of SL2. And they think of this as the left moving copy, this of the right moving copy, or the holomorphic and anti holomorphic copy, where this SL2 acts as Möbius transformations on the complex coordinate z, and this acts as Möbius transformations on the complex coordinate z bar. So these two copies of SL2, they're the global conformal invariance of a two dimensional CFT. But really, it enhances to a full Virazora symmetry. I hope this is somewhat familiar, so just quickly. An SL2 algebra is generated by L0 and L plus or minus 1 with the canonical commutation relations. And these guys are generated by, well, the barred versions, each satisfying their own SL2 algebra. And the Virazoro symmetry is really an infinite extension of these three plus three modes to all modes where n is an integer, and the same for the barred version. So in two dimensions, we really have an infinite symmetry group that is acting on, well, that defines a conformal invariance. OK, just I wrote it down before, but let me quickly do so again. A conformal invariance is a symmetry of space such that it leaves the metric invariant up to some vile factor, where, of course, the transformation is all diffeomorphisms which leave the metric invariant up to a vile factor. And of course, we know how diffeomorphisms act. Okay. It's all transformations where you take a diffeomorphism of space, the metric, which we take to be just flat space metric. So this is really just a delta since we're doing Euclidean. It transforms like this. If this object is the same as the original metric, which we chose to be delta, up to the scale factor, we're talking about conformal transformation. And I showed to you before that these are the generators in arbitrary d, but as I just said, in d equals 2, it gets enhanced. So what, what does this conformal invariance tell us about correlation functions? Let's imagine we have a correlation function of some, OK, I will restrict myself to identical 
primary scalars. So these are scalar operators. Maybe for that purpose, I should denote them with a phi. They're just scalar operators. And they're primary. This, OK, technically speaking, it means that the k's acting on these guys are 0. Um, never mind if that was not too clear. So if you take a correlator of identical scalar operators located at points x prime 1, x prime n, where these points are related to the points x1 through x, xn by a conformal transformation. So let's take a configuration of n points, apply a conformal transformation. We end up with points x1 prime to xn prime. And these two correlators must be equal up to a bunch of these types of vial factors. Is this clear to everyone? This is the statement of conformal invariance. So in particular, imagine that we're doing the two-point function, and we study a configuration which is obtained by performing a dilatation. Then we should enforce that this thing is equal to itself before you applied the dilatation. So you see, this is, this is not obviously true. You cannot write any function that would compute this correlation function if you want this property to be true, that if you rescale the coordinates, you pull out an overall factor. But OK, this was the dilatations. You can do this more generally for all these types of generators. It's a standard exercise, which I'm sure you have done before, if you have ever taken a CFT class or if you ever studied CFT on your own. And the result is, by imposing these types of conditions, is in particular that the two-point function is completely fixed. Once you choose the normalization of your operators, the two-point functions are completely fixed. So in particular, let's do again the two-point function of primary scalars, primary scalar operators. Then we find that phi of x. Now, I will not necessarily take them identical. But conformal invariance, in fact, forces me to take them identical. They have to be identical scalars in a suitable basis. And the coordinate dependence is just given by this. So in particular, you can see that this property holds. If I rescale these two coordinates, I'm going to get an overall factor over here, lambda to the minus, well, lambda to the minus 2 delta phi, which is precisely this type of a factor. So two-point functions are completely fixed by conformal invariance once you choose their normalization and once you like fix your basis of operators. And in that basis, I can take them to be diagonal. Or I can choose a basis such that they are diagonal. But three-point functions, of again, let's do primary scalars as an example. But more generally, three-point functions are completely fixed up to the three-point couplings. So this is where this conformal data starts showing up. Two-point functions we could completely fix up to choosing some basis and normalization, which we can always freely do. Three-point functions, though, will depend on numerical coefficients, which are the three-point couplings that I mentioned here as part of the CFD data. So indeed, if you do this for for three scalar operators, then you find the standard answer that, again, I'm sure most of you have seen before. It's proportional to this coefficient, which we cannot fix by pure symmetry thoughts. This is some dynamical information. But the kinematics of this three-point function does fix the coordinate dependence completely. OK, 
Okay, so this is, okay, I, I always just restrict myself to scalars, but more generally, you can do tensors, you can do anything, and then still these two statements are true. It may be that you have different tensor structures that appear in the three-point function of non-trivial representations of the Lorentz group, <laughs> but then still, they each come with their own three-point coupling, and all the position dependence and that kind of information is fixed by conformity variance for the three-point function. Now, when we get to four-point functions, this is where conformal invariance is not sufficiently powerful anymore to fix the full coordinate invariance or the coordinate dependence for us. But instead, it tells you that, say, again, for scalar operators, and to make my life easier for identical scalars, Conformal invariance is somewhat weak. It just tells you that it must look like something like so. So we have an explicit coordinate factor up front. This factor soaks up the scaling behavior of this correlation function. But we have some arbitrary function of the conformal cross ratios. So this u and v, they're particular combinations of these four coordinates which are invariant under any conformal transformation. So any function of stuff that is invariant under the conformal transformations is, of course, invariant under conformal transformations. And we cannot fix this by uh, symmetry considerations. So OK, just to be concrete, in four dimensions, the conformal cross ratios are x1 minus, oh, I should have said, when I write x1, 2, or more generally, xij, I mean xi, xi minus xj. So, so x12, conform across here is x12 squared, x34 squared divided by x13 squared, x24 squared, and v is the same as u where you exchange 2 and 4. So, in particular, you see you see manifestly that this thing is invariant under translations because it's always differences of co coordinates. It's invariant under scale transformations because we have equally many x's in numerator and denominator. It's invariant under Lorentz rotations because we have manifestly taken singlets under rotations. The only thing that is not trivial to check about this thing is that it is invariant under special conformal transformations. And well, if you're bored, you can check it for yourself. But I assume that most of you have seen these things before. So this is the 4D case. In 2D, the conformal cross ratios are a little bit simpler because the, conf well, the global conformal cross ratios, at least, are a bit simpler. They don't need all these pesky squares. If I write them in terms of their, the holomorphic coordinates of the four points, so these four points x1, x2, 3, 4, in two dimensions, I can write them as a pair of complex coordinates, z1, z1 bar, z2, z2 bar, and so forth. And then I can define a cross ratio as follows for z, and completely uh, similar for z bar. So good. So far, we have learned that conformal symmetry is pretty good at constraining two-point functions. Three-point functions, yeah, pretty good as well, just one constant to be determined by other means. Four-point functions, we lose a bit of steam because we have this, this function of conformal cross ratios, which symmetry doesn't have anything to say about. Symmetry also doesn't have anything to say about, this, about these coefficients. That's why they enter in the conformal data. But OK, I just claimed that over there, the spectrum of operators, so knowing which operators exist in the theory with some conformal dimensions and some Lorentz quantum numbers, together with these numbers, is sufficient to fix all correlators of all local operators, uh, finally many at least. And now I say I don't know how to fix this. So there seems to be some contradiction in what I'm telling you. And the resolution is that conformal symmetry gives you another tool which we haven't used yet and which will, in fact, guarantee us that, at least in principle, we know how to compute this arbitrary function in terms of the conformal data. OK. 
Okay, I don't want to lose that blackboard, so I'll stick to this half. So one tool that we haven't used is operator product expansion, o the OPE as it is often called. So again, restricting myself to scalar primaries, I can look at the OPE of some scalar operator with some other operator. So what does the OPE do? It takes as an input two operators or the product of two operators and it writes it for you as an infinite sum of local operators. So we take two operators and we re-express it as a sum over local operators. So we go from two to one operator. That's essentially the what the OPE does. It re-expresses such a product as an expansion in all the operators in the theory. In fact, I say all the operators in the theory, but you can do a little bit more of an organization in these operators. You can split them in terms of primary operators, where well, maybe I should really at least once write what I mean with primary. So let's take an operator at the origin. Such an operator is a primary if it is annihilated by the action of the special conformal generators. <coughs> if you have such an operator, then that's the bottom component of your multiplet, and you can act arbitrarily many times with momenta in all kinds of different configurations on that operator to start building some type of a multiplet. So all local operators are organized in multiplets of the conformal group. And these multiplets, at least for physics purposes, they're always highest weight representations, where the highest weight is a primary, which by definition is killed by the lowering operators. And then I can act arbitrarily many times with any combination of raising operators, which in this case are the Ps. So why is K a lowering and P a raising operator? That comes from these commutation relations with respect to the dilatation operator which tell us that k has a negative eigenvalue under dilatation, whereas p has a positive eigenvalue. So pretty much like the harmonic oscillator, we have raising operators and lower op lowering operators, which have one unit of positive or negative energy. The same for k and p. k has a negative eigenvalue under dilatation, so these k's are the lowering operators. The lowest state in your multiplet, therefore, is killed by these operators, and then we start building anything on top of that operator by acting with arbitrarily many momentum operators. So all the statements I made over there in terms of this op uh, correlation function of primary operators, I always meant that these scalars satisfy such a relation. So okay, we can restrict ourselves to a sum over primary operators because all these descendant fields, everything you can build by taking the primary and acting arbitrarily many times with momentum, that will be organized, thanks to conformal symmetry, in some manageable structure. And that is something we know how to deal with, just because this is a multiplet of our conformal group, and we understand these multiplets. So this OPE really takes the form of some numerical constant, lambda 1, 2, O, of some object which is completely fixed by conformal invariance. So it looks like this. So this is some object. It takes as an input the position of this operator. It, it also contains a derivative. It acts on my primary. So essentially, this object takes the primary and builds the entire tower of descendants in such a way that conformal invariance is nicely preserved. So it's, it's some differential operator in general. And over here, we see a numerical coefficient, I've already called it lambda again, because you can verify that this lambda is necessarily that lambda. How you can do that, you just take this type of an OPE, you take the product of two scalars, in here you replace it with this entire expression, now we get a bunch of two-point functions, but two-point functions were diagonal, so really at the end of the day, you can convince yourself that these coefficients need to be the three-point functions. And in the same way, you can, in fact, by playing this game, you can figure out what this object is when it acts on a scalar primary. I will not play all these games. I just want to 
well, remind you, hopefully, that the product of two operators in a CFT can be re-expressed as a sum of primaries of some differential object acting on another set of primary operators. If you like, I can at least give you the first term of this operator. As you would expect, the first term is just some exponential of the position, just because we know that uh, conformal invariance will require me that the scaling dimension works out. And the only scaling sc uh, dimension for position we have is the position x. So on the left, we have two times, well, we have delta phi 1, delta phi 2, which in this case I took equal, but we can generalize a bit. We have delta phi 1 plus delta phi 2 minus delta of O. So this is the first term in that thing. It's 1 plus blah, 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 where the blah, blah, blah is some differential stuff, which then makes uh, descendants of this operator O. So, okay, this thing acts on the operator O, so it, here it makes the descendants. OK. I, I need to hurry a little bit. So we have this OPE now at our disposal. Let's now use it. Again, let me simplify my life and consider four identical scalars. So what can I do here? I can use the OPE to expand this product of two <coughs> local operators in terms of such a sum. I can use the OPE here and expand this product of local operators in terms of that sum over local operators. In other words, I can use the operator product algebra twice. I will have a sum over two primary operators over, well, I have a double sum over all primary operators of the three-point coupling between phi phi and that local operator, the three-point coupling of phi phi and the second local operator. I'm just using that thing twice, so I'm going to write it twice. The position that you need to insert now is, of course, x1 minus x2. Position for the second OPE is x3 minus x4. And this thing acts on what is left. So we start off with a four-point function, but we're replacing this with a sum over primary operators. We're replacing this with a sum over primary operators. So what's really left is just a two-point function of primary operators acted on by these beasts. And then we should set y is equal to y tilde is equal to 0. Now remember that two-point functions of primary operators can always, always be chosen diagonal. I can always choose my basis of local operators such that these guys are diagonal. So what that really means is that this double sum over primary operators is really just a single sum just because that thing always is always diagonal. Now the two-point function of any local operator, we know how to compute conformal invariance fixes it for us. These co complicated differential operators, conformal invariance fixes them for us, although I haven't shown you quite how to do that, but they are in principle fixed. They're just conformal kinematics that determines them. So we, at the end of the day, this entire object is something that conformal invariance fixes for us. There's nothing unknown in here from a kinematical point of view. And this entire object goes under the name of a conformal partial wave. So conformal partial wave. And it's, again, it's a kinematical object. It can be computed, well, just using symmetry properties of the conformal groups we're considering. Okay. And if you pull out some useful factors, it becomes the, the standard conformal block. So essentially, for my purpose in this talk, conformal partial wave and conformal block are essentially the same thing. 
So now I achieved what I promised you. I have computed the four-point function in terms of information that I do know. I do know the three-point couplings. This thing is completely determined by conformal invariance. So indeed, I can compute the four-point function in terms of information I know. And this story, of course, generalizes. If I want to compute a five-point function, I can always use the OPE, reduce it to a four-point function, well, to a sum of four-point functions, use the OPE again, reduce it to a sum of three-point functions. In principle, at this point, I'm done because three-point functions I know. But you can even go one step further and reduce it to a sum of two-point functions, as I did over here. And two-point functions, again, you know. Or if you really insist, you do the OP yet again, reduce it to a sum of one-point functions. And in the conformal field theory, all one-point functions are zero, except for the one of the identity operator. That you can easily check by, OK, it's gone by just inf imposing conformal invariance on a one-point function. You will see that the only possibility is uh, to have the one-point function of the identity operator. All the other one-point functions must be zero. OK. So just to draw a picture, people typically denote the operation I did here in a picture like this. So here they have the operator at position x1, here the operator at position x2, x3, and x4. So this is the picture people draw. This is the conformal block or yeah, conformal block decomposition of this four-point function. Internally, we have this operator O. And now maybe you start seeing the connection to what we have been doing over there, because if I fatten these lines, I get exactly that picture back. OK, so this is a conformal block decomposition. And in fact, if you're interested in the conformal bootstrap, you should observe that there was no reason why we should group these operators first and then these operators. I could as well have grouped these and these together to perform my OPE. So I could as well have done something like this. And this, the fact that these two expressions need to be equal is very non-trivial. And these are the conformal bootstrap constraints. Anyway, this is a localization school, not a bootstrap school, so I'll, I'll just leave it. No, I, I think I have the position dependence already. But, well, maybe you're right. Does it mean that it would be singular? Is y equals y tilde, isn't it? Sorry? Isn't there y equals y tilde if they equal the wind that's diverted something? Oh, well. OK, maybe you're right. I, I. OK, in the last 10 minutes, let's do some Leoville theory. So let's become concrete about which TFT we're talking about. We're talking about a two-dimensional conformal field theory. As I said, two-dimensional conformal field theories, in fact, have a quite big symmetry algebra. They have Virazoro, a Virazoro symmetry in the holomorphic sector, a Virazoro symmetry in the anti-holomorphic sector. So uh, concretely, it means that we have a conserved stress tensor which satisfies an operator product expansion as follows plus regular terms. You see this number C appear here. This is the central charge of the two dimensional conformal field theory. And in, for Liouville, it is given by. 1 plus 6 times q squared, where q is, of course, b plus b inverse. And any b goes. You choose any real b. Then you find some value for q. You find your central charge. Okay. So similarly for the, for the Virazori algebra acting on the anti-holomorphic 
dependence, you have a similar OPE with the same central charge. And in this CFT, I should tell you what is the spectrum and what is what are the three-point couplings. So let me just tell you a closed subsector of the spectrum. Those are scalar There are scalar primary operators. So there exist in this theory scalar primary operators. They are labeled by, is there a question? No. So there exist scalar primary operators in this theory which are labeled by some continuous variable alpha where really you should think of alpha as Q over 2 plus I times some Liouville momentum, where P is some real number. And their conformal weight, the conformal weight is equal to their, their right moving conformal weight is equal to their left moving conformal weight is given by alpha times Q minus alpha. So, okay, I haven't quite told you what conformal weights are, so maybe I should say that the conformal dimension is equal to the sum of these two. Okay, so we have, as a subsector of the spectrum, scalar primary operators, which are labeled by a continuous parameter alpha, which is imaginary, but really has a truly free real parameter sitting here and their conformal dimension is twice this number. So alpha times Q minus alpha, you can verify that. If you plug that in, you always get some real positive number, as it should be. Now you should also notice that V alpha and V Q minus alpha, they have the exact same conformal dimension. It's, it's obviously the case and in fact, these two operators, they're really the same operator in the theory. So that means that you can write one in terms of the other with some function in between. This thing is called the reflection amplitude. It's not very important what it is. It's just important to realize that only, really only half the range that you can have in alpha is, is physical. The other half goes back to itself upon using this kind of a relation. Okay, we know, well, we know the spectrum, at least the spectrum we care about. The three-point couplings, I will tell you in a second, but let me first write the operator product expansion of these scalar primaries. It's a little bit more complicated than what we had over there. Over there, our OPE was just a sum over primary operators, but you see here that we have a continuum of primary operators in the theory. So instead of a sum, we really end up with an integral so I put a half here precisely because of this reason I explained here only half of the range is, is physically relevant I have an integral sitting here over well over all these primaries I have some explicit position dependence which at one point I specified the very first term of this operator C this is the term I'm going to write. So before I called this entire object, this C acting on the operator, now I have taken the first term of that operator, which is just the overall scaling dimension taken care of with some position dependence of the primary at the origin and all these dot 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 since now we're in a two-dimensional CFT they're just not they're not just conformal invariants but they're really Virazoro uh, conformal descendants but they're really Virazoro descendants 
but that shouldn't scare us. The idea is exactly the same as up there, uh, but instead of being able to act with all kinds of momentum operators, here we can act with all the raising operators in the mode expansion of the stress tensor. So remember that the stress tensor has a mode expansion well, in terms of these modes Ln, where minus 1, 0, and 1 generated the global part of the conformal group. We can act on this beast with all the raising operators, which in particular mean with all the n for n positive. So we act with all these and we get Firazora descendants. Actually not L0. Sorry. And of course in here I made one, I forgot to write one thing. The three-point coupling So this is the OPE, and now I should just tell you what is the three-point coupling, and I have given you enough information to at least compute correlators of these primary scalar operators. So I deliberately put the index up here, and this object with one index up is related to the standard three-point coupling which I denote as this thing with three, with three inputs as follows, where, where you do the <coughs> this, this reflection. And this object is given by the DOZZ formula. So this stands for uh, three people who figured out this formula. Uh, four people. I'm s well, <laughs> the Z's are a bit degenerate, so it's two two times some logic of. Oh, okay. Dolan and Osborne. No, not Dolan and Osborne. Dotsenko yeah, and. No, no. Oh, anyway. <laughs> oh, fine. <laughs> anyway, so this object, it has some overall prefactor, which okay, we shouldn't be scared of since we can still decide to change the normalization of the operators times the derivative of the upsilon function evaluated at 0, an upsilon function evaluated at 2 alpha, 1 at 2 alpha 2, 1 at 2 alpha 3, divided by for more of these upsilon functions where the symbol alpha is the sum of the th three parameters. It's okay, this is, this is just an expression that people have figured out. I guess maybe I should put a t here because it was proved unambiguously by, by the T. So, okay, this is the three-point coupling of Liouville theory. And you see, very nicely, you see a bunch of Upsilon functions appear, which slowly start to make contact with what I have written over there. So in the last one minute, Let me tie up things. By computing the four point function in Liouville theory. So I'm just going to use the OPE twice. I use it here. Well, no, I actually only use it once. I use the OPE here, and then I have a three-point function. And three-point functions I know because I know the three-point couplings. So that's, that's what I'm doing. It's equivalent to what we did just now in terms of doing it twice.
So this is the result. We get, again, this factor of half because of this reflection thing. Uh, we get two three-point couplings, and we get a conformal block squared. The square comes from the fact that everything is really, well, you can factorize everything in holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. Uh, well, you can separately study holomorphic dependence and anti-holomorphic dependence, or said differently, we have a Vira Zora times a Vira Zora bar symmetry acting. So you get, anyway, you get two copies of the conformal block sitting here. One for the holomorphic dependence, one for the anti-holomorphic dependence. So you get this mod squared. And this is, as I was mentioning earlier, this is the Vira Zoro conformal block. So it contains all, all information about all Vira Zoro descendants of these primaries, which is of the primary which is labeled by P, just like we had in our. Uh, Okay, it's gone, but anyway. Just like the C operators, this differential operator, it contained all information about conformal descendants. Now we have an object <coughs> that is similarly carrying all information of the Virazoro descendants if I act on it on this two-point function. And okay, my time is really up, so I should I would just like to mention now that this result looks very much like that result. If you plug in these two three-point couplings. But it doesn't quite look like that. You need to do some clever uh, renormalization of your theory of your vertex operators. So we're going to renormalize these guys a little bit. Just change their normalization. Then the three-point couplings will change a little bit. It's important to keep in mind that in the OPE we had this index up. So if you do the normalization, be a bit careful. We get a normalization factor here, normalization factor here. But essentially, here you get it as well. But if you absorb it all in here, you get the inverse. Well, you get the inverses from here, and you get the normalization factor itself from there. So these two are not quite an equal footing when you start introducing these normalization factors. But if you do it all right, then you find that this object is identically equal to that object with parameters identified in the natural way, if I haven't made mistakes in writing that object over there. Of course. I used to have expressions for these mu's. They're, they're gone by now, but anyway, it should, it should match. So this is the statement of the AGT correspondence. We have computed a four-point correlator in Liouville theory, which, again, is represented by a picture like this. And we have shown that this four-point function is equal to the partition function of the fourth sphere of a theory labeled by precisely this type of picture. Or if you like me to, to fatten it, we're computing a Liouville correlator on the sphere with four punctures, where the, at the punctures we have these vertex operator insertions. So at the level of the three-point couplings, it's relatively easy. I was describing it earlier. After you take care of some normalizations, you will find exactly the one loop determinant. And the real miracle of this story is that this Virazoro conformal block precisely matches with the instant on partition function if you do all the parameter identifications the way you should do. <laughs> and this generalizes to all theories of class S of type A1. It also generalizes to theories of class S of type AN. In that case, we're not talking about Liouville theory, but we're talking about Toda. Toda is a bit, well, it's a lot more complicated, so that's, that's all I have to say about AGT correspondence, I think. <laughs>